in this kind of thing for a number of years now. Uh, I got started uh, a few years before my retirement. Uh, mainly, uh, I got started in a group that's called the uh, Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War, which means I have ancestors, ancestors, as, uh, and uh, some uncles, grand great uncles, and a great grandfather that fought in the Civil War. And uh, that allowed me to join this uh, uh, SUVCW, which is really not a reenactment group. It's a uh, group that's nationally that uh, does memorial dedications, rededications, and educational things like this, but they do not do reenactments. That's not to say members of that group like myself do or do do reenactments but that's not what that group's all about. Uh, besides that group, I belong to other uh, reenactment groups, ASW, Army of the Southwest, which represents the Confederacy as well as the uh, Union Federal Troops, uh, the Third Iowa Cav. So I'm, I'm an infantry soldier as well as a cavalry soldier, which is a mounted horse. Uh, I used to have a horse, I don't anymore. Uh, anyway, I still belong to the group. And uh, I've done some artillery reenactment. I've even uh, portrayed a Confederate soldier on a battlefield uh, when they needed one, but that's not my beggie. Anyway, uh, my presentation usually consists of, I start out with talking a little bit about my great-grandfather when he was mustered in and so forth. Unfortunately, he died uh, about five months after he was uh, in this and recruited into the war, which was early, and he died of pneumonia. Uh, I'll just go ahead and start out. <clears throat> My great-grandfather's name was Malin Hartman. He uh, lived on a farm down in uh, southern Iowa, Mahaska County, Oskaloosa area. He was recruited uh, uh, September of 1861 and the war had started in uh, April of that year, 1861. Anyway, Lincoln had called for 75,000 volunteers after uh, the first Battle of Manassas, uh, after they figured out this war is going to be more than just a 90-day. Uh, actually, they, it, it, they recruited these 75,000 or one of these volunteers for a 90-day enlistment. They thought it was going to be only be a 90-day uh, war or less or maybe a, a month or two more. As it turned out, it was four years. Anyway, my great-grandfather uh, mustered in in September uh, down in the Oskaloosa area, and they recruited uh, around 1,000 uh, soldiers or men at that time from the Oskaloosa or Mahaska, Jasper County, and their surrounding county area. In October, they were formed into a regiment uh, in Davenport, Iowa, and then from that point, they were transported by rail, not by riverboat, but rail that followed the Mississippi River down to the uh, Jefferson Barracks area, which is around the St. Louis area. And at that point, they would have been, he would have been formed into a regiment. And uh, actually, the regiment, I think, was formed in Davenport. They were transported down there, and they would have been issued uh, the uniform very much uh, similar to what I have on, uh, which is a, their battle dress of that, of that day. And it consists of the sack coat, which is what I have on. And by the way, these are 100% wool. They're very hot. <laughs> uh, even in your, if you're in air conditioning, they're, they're pretty warm. But uh, at the day, 150 years ago, people didn't wear short sleeve stuff like you have on today. You know, I like to be cool too, wear short, short sleeve shirts. But the only thing you seen was uh, your face and hands. 
You didn't show anything else besides that unless you were in your tent or in the bedroom or whatever. Anyway, he would have been issued a this sack coat, a pair of trousers, sky blue trousers like this. Let me get out in front. Get a little better view. A uh, pair of Jefferson booties, they call them, or brogans. They're 100% leather. They're machine made. As I mentioned to somebody earlier, machines, sewing machines were made or invented, uh, I think, by Elias Howell uh, in the 1850s. But it was used primarily for to make leather uh, clothing or leather shoes, horse tack, saddles, and, and things like that. It wasn't used to make clothing. The, the clothing that was issued was handmade. Now these are replicas and, and they're, they're all machine made and so forth. Uh, you have a shirt, you can't see it very easy, but you have a shirt on underneath that. And it's not a button down shirt, it buttons down this far and then it uh, sl slips over, pretty baggy and blousy. Uh, and you have socks, you have under drawers. Uh, you would also been issued for armament, uh, leathers, uh, the leather stuff. Besides a rifle that you would been issued, you have a uh, cartridge box. And by the way, also that cartridges in those that day or the day of the, of the Civil War were paper. I'll show you. Well, here's an example of one right here. This is made up. This is a uh, actually an actual bullet that was taken off the Gettysburg battlefield. Uh, I don't know, several years ago. It's illegal to do that now, but the time this was picked up, it was legal to pick up things. And they sold, they had a gift shop, craft shop that they sold things out of, and this was bought out of that. Uh, anyway, that come off the Gettysburg battlefield, and this is what they would be, look like. Now, besides uh, talking about my uniform, and we're going to load and fire one of these muskets, but not really. I'm just going to go through on how to do that. I think you you were here three years ago. I don't know if you remember how I done that. Anyway, we're not really going to load and fire. We're just going to pretend like we did. Uh, my great grandfather really didn't participate in anything after he this regiment got formed. He, uh, some minor skirmishes around the St. Louis area. He wound up with pneumonia are cold, which develop into ammonia, pneumonia, and he died in a hospital in Sedalia, Missouri, which is not too far from that area, uh, kind of southeast of uh, here, northwest of uh, St. Louis, uh, February the 6th, 1862, which is only about five months, almost six months to when he was recruited and joined. And ironically, his brother, one of his brothers, he had four brothers, three of which, uh, besides himself, joined the army. But uh, two of them died. But the one of the brothers died two days after he did with the same thing out in Massachusetts. And I forget, it was in an Illinois regiment. I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly what uh, regiment it was in Illinois. But this was pretty common in the day for families. That even happens today. But if anybody's ever seen Saving Private Ryland, that you know kind of tells the story uh, about the about brothers that were in the military that got killed in action. Anyway, uh, in in the Civil War, uh, and in, and especially the South, this happened a lot. It happened to a lot of Northern. Uh, folk as well, but the South was virtually destroyed by, by the war, by bombs and, and family just burnings and so forth. Uh, but it was pretty devastating. Uh, of the casualties during the Civil War, uh, I think there was around you know, round numbers, 360,000 casualties uh, in the federal side, Union, which be the United States, the Northern troops. 
uh, that died during the war. Well, 260,000 of those died from disease and infections, not from battle wounds, not direct, direct from battle sh shot wounds. They might, the infections they in, incurred might have been from a battle wound or for some kind of an injury, but uh, most of that was like uh, pneumonias, chickenpox, smallpox, diphtherias, all kinds of diseases that they had inoculations for now that they didn't in that day. So the uh, devastation of death and, and uh, maiming of the soldiers was uh, quite uh, prominent in that day. Uh, anyway, so, so the story of my great-grandfather really is pretty short. And now my other, uh, my great uh, uncle that survived the war, uh, he was in a CAV unit down in, in somewhere and recruited from Southern Iowa. And uh, he was, I think he was in the third Iowa CAV or maybe the fourth. Anyway, he, uh, we don't know much about him after the war. There's, there's not much paper trail uh, from that. But uh, so there, of the four brothers that joined the army, there was only one that survived. So I wanted to mention that. And also, during the war, Iowa provided more per capita, more soldiers per capita than any other state, which meant that, uh, you know, by some accounts, and, and you have to be an accountant to figure this out, I guess, uh, the eligibility for fighting in the war was like 16. If you were 16, you were eligible to join. But they did have people, or boy, drummer boys that were as young as 14. Some of them lied. They were even 12 years old when they went in. But uh, anyway, the, the statistics for Iowa was about like 25% up to 58%, depending on what kind of numbers you're looking at, of the male population that went to war that fought during the, from Iowa. Now, there was 76,000 soldiers, 76,343, something like that, that uh, over the four-year period fought during the war. That's really a small number compared to people that recruited out of Chicago, New York, or places. But those populations are like in the millions. And Iowa only had a population of, what, 300,000, 250,000 or something like that. Uh, so the the population uh, of the soldiers that joined from Iowa was a higher percentage, and this included the southern states that uh, provided soldiers. The, fortunately or unfortunately, the southern states do, doesn't have a very good paper trail, so we don't really know exactly, uh, but that's as close as we can tell because they can't come up with, every state can't come up with all the figures that were provided uh, to that fought because some of the uh, soldiers that were fought during the war that probably weren't even formed in a regiment from the South. And this happened a little bit in the North. Let me get back behind my table here. Now, as I mentioned before, we're going to load and fire this uh, weapon here in a little bit, which we're not, so uh, we're not gonna really go, gonna load it. We're just gonna go through the actions. But along with uh, what a soldier would have been uh, issued would be the, you know, like the cap pouch that has the cartridge box, or I'm sorry, the cartridge box, which has the paper cartridges in them. And these were made by, in a factory situation, by uh, usually women labor, woman labor, because the men were out fighting the war. And, and the women, you know, they played their part. They manufactured things like during the Second World War, they, they made things like this, uh, uh, sewed uniforms, made uniforms and flags and all kinds of war efforts uh, things. They would have, had, have to have a cap pouch that has a cap in it to set off that charge that we're gonna put in this weapon. They would have been issued a bayonet that goes along that goes on top of that they would have been issued a haversack and that's what i have on here and a haversack because these trousers 
you, they have front pockets, no back pockets, but you can't get to them anyway. So you have to have some way to, thank you, I'll probably need that in a little bit. You have to have some way to carry some of your personal items. And personal items meaning, well, like this, uh, I don't need those kind of glasses, but uh, if you have cigars, anyway, you got a wooden comb, you might have an apple, this, by the way, this is a wooden apple. You might have a flask. Now, these are personal things. That wouldn't be issued, but the haversack is to carry your personal items. You have to have some uh, way to eat your meals. If you have a chance to get into a situation where you're uh, in a camp situation, you, you have meals uh, that you're issued salt pork and coffee. You have a plate that's very similar to this. These are a three-tang fork, a knife, a spoon, uh, some calf stuff, a pair of binoculars. I brought these. Uh, you might have these. Uh, an officer would be, be carrying these. An enlisted man wouldn't be issued a pair of binoculars. So some of this stuff is for officers. Uh, you had been issued a collapsible cup, probably, or at least that was available. Now, this is aluminum, but they did have a collapsible cups just like this. And we know that from uh, uh, excavation sites where artifacts were dug up out of a particular area of battle or so forth. Some of these items, like I've shown, these are all replicas except for these uh, bullets that I'm showing you. They're all replicas of the, of the items that would have been found and have been used during the war. Uh, this cup, uh, very similar to, to uh, what would have been used. Here's a big cup. You've got to, got to use that for coffee or for lots of things. That's been on a fire several times. Put soups or something in it. Heat up coffee, heat up water, make coffee. You had been issued the, uh, on a daily ration basis, like I say, the salt pork, which is like a bacon, only it's in, in cubes, hardtack. In fact, up through, even through World War I, they made hardtack, up until they come with the sea rations. Uh, and it's what it is, is a uh, flour and water, and, uh, and, you, and you mix that together with a little bit of salt, and then it's baked. And this is made in a factory setting, kind of like a Betty Crocker thing, sent out to the field. And if it stays dry, it'll last, I won't want to say forever, but it'll last several hundred years. <clears throat> There's some of this that was, that was under, in its original package uh, that was uh, in the Smithsonian Institute that was from the Civil War era, which is over 150 years old. And it's still good. And it is, as long as you keep it dry, uh, it, it'll be all right. If it gets wet, it's like anything food item. If it gets wet, it'll kind of get moldy, or it'll get, <clears throat> excuse me, bugs or, or things in it that uh, you don't want to eat. Uh, but a soldier might get kind of hungry and, and would put it in their hot coffee and let the bugs and the whatever crawl out and skim that off the top and eat it anyway. This is one thing I'm lacking that would go over. Uh, this shoulder here. That's the last thing when you fill it, put your uniform on the last thing you put on is your canteen and The reason is if because when it goes dry if you got it under your belt and everything you got to take everything off to get it to Get it filled up again So you don't want to put that on first or second or whatever. That's the last thing you put on Other items The army frowned on gambling, but the uh, soldiers played cards like most soldiers do. So you would have had a deck of cards and they didn't have numbers on them. All they had was just the spots or whatever. So the, the decks are the, quite different than they are today. Uh, you would have had other items. If you had any teeth, a lot of people or a lot of soldiers didn't have very good teeth, but if you did, you had a toothbrush made out of horse hair. Um, 
when the army or when the soldiers uh, got paid, they had a bill for you did get paid with, uh, uh, in fact, you know, during the Civil War was the first time that the government started to make paper money. Up until that time, states made some paper money, banks made paper money, but the federal government did not make paper money until during the war. So anyway, you got paid in, in paper currency like this. This is replica of. So you would carry, be carrying that in your haversack as the personal item. Like I mentioned, a flask. Uh, drinking wasn't necessarily frowned on, but it wasn't condoned by the army. So this flask was for obvious reasons, other than drinking water. Put some cider or something in it. Carry that in your personal haversack. Uh, also, I didn't mention what you had been issued is your hat. Now, if you were in the Eastern Army or even in the Western Army, you would have been issued a what they call a kepi. This is called a kepi. And it would fit something like this. This one doesn't fit very good because I don't like to wear it. Anyway, my the Regiment that my great-grandfather was in was the, was the 8th Regiment, 8th Iowa Regiment, Company H, and the symbol for uh, infantry in those days was the French bugle horn. Now today's symbol for an infantry soldier is crossed, uh, well, I was going to say muskets, but crossed rifles. But the reason like my great-grandfather would have wear, wore a uniform or a hat like, like this because in the Western Army, especially in the, in the cavalry, they like to wear what they call a slouch hat. Now this is a, a variation of a slouch hat and this is what you're probably used to seeing in, in soldiers and so forth, especially in the, uh, the mounted cavalry. Uh, the biggest reason is you can see, you know, you got a small bill. Here, here you, this will shade you from the sun, protect you from the elements better than this kind of a hat. And also, this hat can be wadded up and reshaped, but wadded up when you're sleeping at night, you could use it as a pillow or at least put your head on it, uh, keep your, put your ears on it. This is kind of hard to do that with. So it serves several purposes besides uh, uh, just wearing it. Now also, you, the sold foot soldier, or even a calf soldier, we're going to talk a little bit about a calf soldier and show you the difference between weapons, uh, uh, between the infantry rifle and the way they load and a cavalry uh, rifle, the way they load. I got this as a tent. What this is, and I, I can't put a tent up here. Uh, what I have is, and I'm going to pass it around here, uh, drawings of what a tent would look like. The Army issued them as a shelter tent, but the soldier wound up calling them a dog tent because the uh, soldier, common infantry soldier, excuse me, got the nickname as dog soldier. So the dog tent is the forerunner of the pup tent, so you can pass that around. It's just a, <clears throat> it's a, actually a small tent. It only stands about that high. It's about five feet uh, yeah, in each side, five feet long, which means that if you're in this tent, you're sleeping on the ground, you take your poncho and lay it on the ground as a ground cloth because the ground will sweat even if it's not uh, rainy out the ground will sweat if you don't have something down to protect you from the uh, the ground. It's you're going to wake up in the morning damp, and you could get cold. Anyway, the uh, when you're sleeping in this tent, like it, you could, it's designed to put two, at least two soldiers in, and one half is it's five foot square. Uh, and one, and you button when you march to where you're going, you're going to say you're on a, oh, a march from one place to another, 
on a, on a temporary basis and you're going to uh, sleep overnight, you take this one half of this tent, button it together, forage out in the forest if there's trees available, usually there is, uh, and make this tent. You got a uh, ridge pole would be a, a tree limb and your uprights would be a tree limb and then you got just wooden pegs to, to hold it up. Uh, so the soldier would be sleeping in his tent. You know, I'm more than five foot tall. Now, the army, this is written in the army manual, you were supposed to sleep with your feet under the tent, your head out. And the reason for that, an infantry soldier, and uh, especially a, a, a private like myself, no stripes, don't have to think, but you have to do a lot of marching. You gotta protect your feet. So all you need to do is put your hat on. You need your head just to hold your hat. You don't need it for anything other. That was the mentality, uh, anyway, of, of the thought of the day. Uh, so you were supposed to sleep with your head out and your feet under the tent. So just a little bit of, I don't know if you call it trivia, but that's part of the, the Army manual. Now, the soldier, you know, this looks brand new, but it's several years old. It's just I've never put it on a fire. I use it all the time. It's stainless steel. They didn't have stainless steel back in the day. So it would look, uh, this is called a mucket. It looked very similar to this as far as what it would look like after you use it. And the reason they call it a mucket is because it's, it's a bucket with a, or a mug, you might say, with a bale on it. A bucket has a bale and a mug has a handle, so it's just a combination of bucket and mug. Mug, bucket, mucket. Get my self tongue-tied here. So that's, that's uh, just uh, something a, a soldier would probably, he wouldn't be issued that, but he would buy that at the store. Now the stores, they, when they had large armies, and we're talking armies, 30, 40, 50,000 soldiers marching from one place to another uh, after the war got started. You know, initially, we were talking just a few thousand soldiers in one spot, two, 3,000 soldiers. But when you have large armies on the march, like back east or even out west, uh, you would have uh, these merchants, what they call sutlers, that they were in covered wagons. They would go from, just follow the, uh, the soldiers right along. And so when things wore out or if you need, needed things, because the uh, common soldier would have got, or the private would have got $13 a month, which isn't a lot, but that's more than they were making at home probably. Anyway, that gave them some spending money so they could buy things like this. Uh, you could buy, replace uniform parts, uh, buy some uh, utensils that got lost. Uh, because when you were on the march, you want to be as light as you can. Some of this stuff just got thrown away or discarded. Because you had, if you didn't carry it, and nobody else would carry it, so they'd just throw it away or burn it like this stuff here, and then go to another place and either buy something or probably more like, more or less just make something or forage something, some nuts or something for, to play uh, with the, on your chest, chest board. Uh, like I say, you had been issued something like this. Uh, where am I at here? Uh, before I get into loading and fire one of these weapons. Uh, I, got, I got a flag here that is a replica. It's called a Fort Sumter flag. And the flag that flew over Fort Sumter was a, was a garrison type flag, which would have been huge, like 12 by 25. This is not that big, but it's the same design. Now, if you count the stars on there, you have 33. At the beginning of the war, you had 34. Does anybody know why? Why that? I mean, why there was only 33 stars? Well, it's the same rule today as it, or then as it is today. When a state is added, 
a star isn't added to the flag until the 4th of July. Well, Kansas happened to be uh, become part of the Union uh, in January of 1861. Well, the four didn't start until April. So that made 34 states, only 33 stars. So after the 4th of July of 1861, there was a 34 star flag. Now, by the end of the war, there was 36 states. And, and then by the addition, the 35th state was West Virginia because when Virginia seceded from the Union, the western part of Virginia didn't want to be part of the Confederacy, so they elected to be uh, one of the northern states. So that's how West Virginia became a state. Now, towards the tail end of the war, Lincoln needed votes, electoral votes, which wasn't very many, but he needed some electoral votes so he could try to win the election. And Nevada was added. That was, uh, I think, in November of 1864. So that was a 36th state. So at the end of the war, in April of 1865 is when, when the war ended officially and there was 36 states. And so anyway, back to loading the, the musket. I don't fall over here. Get to dancing around here. Now there's quite a process to load and fire one of these things. Now this is called a musket or a muzzle loader. It's a, an old type. It's an 1842 actually, 1842 Springfield 69 caliber. Now to load one of these you want to get into your cartridge box and pull out a cartridge like this. The command is loaded nine times. It takes nine specific steps to load and fire one of these. And after you, and it's a single shot, after you fire it, you got to start all over and do this again. And if you can imagine, you're up out in the battlefield, loading it the first time is okay, you're probably loaded before the enemy is firing at you. But after you fire the first time, you're, it's, it's like any battle, you're kind of in a hurry and you got somebody else shooting back at you and you're standing up there shoulder to shoulder out on the battlefield loading these things. It's, you know, why does anybody want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it was pride. That's just what they'd done in those days. By the end of the war, they were hiding. They were down in Petersburg, for example. You had trench warfare. You didn't see that again until the First World War. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, it takes, you know, you got to put yourself back 150 years ago. It's a different culture, North and South. And, uh, but, but it's it actually part of, it, of the mentality of why does a soldier go to war? You know he's going to get shot at, uh, especially if there's a conflict or a war going on. They're not going to, uh, but when you're young, you feel invincible. You don't think you're going to get shot. And of course, I'm, I'm not young. And yeah, I don't know if I'd want to be doing that or not. Anyway, we'll get back to it. We'll load and fire this thing. Uh, and, and remember, after you fire the first shot, you're going to, you've got people, you've got to load and fire this again. You've got people shooting at you. And you're standing up there letting them shoot at you. Well, okay, the load to be, or the command would be load it nine times. You get in your ca cartridge box, tear this off. And uh, by the way, the, one of the physical attributes to get in the infantry army in the day was to have two teeth, one on top, one on the bottom, opposing each other so you can tear this. If you didn't have the teeth, you can't tear the cartridge. You can't load your weapon, so you're not in the army. You might be in the cavalry, they use a different type of weapon. They don't need teeth to shoot the gun, but this one you do. Anyway, you load this, tear this off, pour it down in there like this, push everything down in there. I'm going to lay that there. Pull out the rammer. 
That's not loaded. It wouldn't go down that far. It wouldn't ping. Uh, anyway, you tamp that down in there good. Return it. And you use this pinky. Because if you do it like that, after you load and fire this a few times, if you get in the habit of doing this, you're probably going to get a hole in your hand because the black powder that's in there, you might have some burning embers, uh, paper, all the powder might not went off. When you pour fresh powder down in there and you do this, it could go off and injure yourself. Anyway, so you want to uh, keep the muzzle away from your face. Use this, use this finger to return the rammer. Okay, and you go back to this position here. Actually, and then you don't go back to this position. You just go up to this position because you got to get in your cap pouch, go half cock, put a cap on there, like so. In fact, I don't know, most of you older folks anyways heard the term half cock. Well, that's what that, where that come from. When you cock your gun, half cock, it don't fire. And if you go off half cock, that means you malfunctioned, and the gun malfunctioned. So, so that's where that term really. That's where that term come from. So you're ready to fire. Then you, now you go down to this position. So, but if you're, that's now that's that's to load the weapon. That's not firing it. So you're going to get the command ready, aim, fire. So we're going to go up there and fire it. I'm not going to do that because it'll it will make a loud noise like a cap going off. Now, as I mentioned, this is a 69 caliber, 1842 vintage that was left over from the Mexican War that was uh, stored in the Harpers Ferry Arsenal in Harpers Ferry. Uh, it's West Virginia now, but at the time it was Virginia. So they had to draw these weapons out. Uh, because of the size of the bullet, 69 caliber, that's awful large. Uh, you can put put a finger down in there. They, uh, I'm not sure how they settled, why they settled on a 58 caliber. But the, by the end of the war, within uh, within a year, they started when they started remanufacturing or making weapons. They they started making them with 58 caliber, and smaller, a little bit shorter. It fired, loaded, and fired the same, but they were about two inches shorter. Used less lead, less powder. So then that's probably the real reason they wanted to use uh, less lead, less powder, because you had thousands of soldiers uh, shooting. You yes. How far would that shoot fire? Well, this is calibrated for 800 yards. The round ball is what we, we would have been shooting. The uh, mini ball that would have been added uh, uh, to make it more accurate will shoot two or 300 yards pretty accurately. And what makes the mini ball more accurate is, here's one that don't have the cartridge on it. Uh, a round ball is, is a round ball, a round piece of lead. The mini ball is like this. It was invented by a captain by the, a French captain by the name of Claude Monet. Well, when the Americans got a hold of that name, they call it mini. Well, it should have been called Monet, but anyway. The Americans have a way of corrupting words. <laughs> so this is what they call a mini ball. It doesn't look like a ball at all. It's, it's a conical shaped bullet. But by the addition of the conical shaped bullet, mini ball, and the addition of rifling in the barrel, it made it more accurate from 80 yards up to two, 300 yards. Actually, they're accurate for more than that, 500 yards, but it's hard to see that far. But your typical soldier was shooting two couple hundred yards, maybe 300 yards. So that's how accurate they are. You, uh, I mean, if you were experienced and used to shooting and uh, and hiding behind something uh, where you could really take careful aim, you could probably shoot pretty accurately, a couple 300 yards, pretty easily. Uh, now. This is for the infantry soldier. The cavalry soldier shoots a much different type of weapon. 
because this takes two hands at least to, to fire this. Now, I talked about when you're standing up and let the, uh, you're firing at the enemy, the enemy's firing at us. We're about eight, uh, 80 to 100 yards from each other. We're marched out on this battlefield. Well, by the, the addition of this mini ball, the tactics of the day hadn't caught up with the technology of the, the bullet because the tactics uh, dictated for the 80 yard or the mini ball or the round ball rather, not the mini ball. Because of the addition of the mini ball, the more accurate bullet made it more accurate. So if you're only 80 to 100 yards away, you're going to be pretty accurate. But if you had were just shooting a round ball, you're probably not going to hit what you're shooting at. You might hit somebody in that line, but you're not going to hit the person you're shooting at. That's why they lined up that way. That's called the old Napoleonic type tactics, European tactics. That's the way Napoleon fought wars and, and other uh, generals over in Europe, the French or the British as well as the French. So we adopted that, but by the end of war, we were doing different tactics because the commanders out in the field l learned fairly quickly, you know, we can't do that. We gotta start hiding from the enemy. We can't stand up there and let them shoot at us. Well, they did do that, but they, they didn't start doing that until after the Battle of Gettysburg, actually. As you remember out in Gettysburg, you know, they had thousands of soldiers lined up uh, in different parts of the battlefield and shooting at each other. Well, you had these accurate bullets that uh, that's why there were so many thousands of casualties. And they weren't all death shots, but they were, if you got hit by one of these, the black powder burned so slow and it was a, a, such a big bullet, if it hit a bone, and it, uh, they had to amputate. If you got hit in the midsection, you probably weren't going to make it. I mean, some people did, but most of them didn't. The casualty rate was really high. You know, you lost limbs, uh, arms, legs, and so forth. They didn't have the surgery. You know, they had doctors, and they didn't know about the germs and so forth. You see movies or see scenes in movies where they just cut off limbs and throw them away and take a bucket of water and wash off the table. There was no sanitation. Uh, that's why there was so much infections and so forth. And, and uh, uh, the, the, it was a devastating war in that regard in more ways than one. So the Cavs soldier would wear something like this and they have a cap pouch and a cartridge box which is back here. It's going to look similar to what this, I'm not going to spend the time to uh, adjust everything. I'm going to lay that there, put this strap on, because when you're mounted on a horse, change hats. And the main reason is, I could have changed cords, but the different color. Blue is uh, infantry color. And, and yellow is cavalry color. Red is artillery. Now this pistol, or this rifle is called a sharps. And it's a breech loader. It uses essentially the same kind of cartridge to load that, only it goes from back here. Now I put that in there, and when you close this breech like that, it cuts the paper off and exposes the powder. So I still got to get in this cap pouch, go half cock, get in the... Uh, and put a cap on this if you don't drop it. That's all right. You're on a horse dancing around. There you go, thank you. Anyway, a good soldier could do this 
one-handed. You've got to rein the horse with your teeth or one hand anyway. Uh, but you could load this and fire this and just hang it down like this. But you can do it with one hand because you've got the horse. Open this up. Put this cartridge in there. Close this. Ah, I need to lubricate that. Anyway, uh, and you're ready to go. And they and in the day they didn't have scabbards to put on your ho to mount on your horse. They did have a little boot though that this would go down into, so it wouldn't be flopping around, but it would just hang from your body when you're mounted on a horse. It's kind of crude and elementary, but the way they done it. In reality, though, the calf soldier would probably take his saber, which was on, on the scabbard in the horse, and he would use this and about on the horse and the pistol. A soldier that was in battle, that fought a lot of battle, would probably carry two or three pistols as well as a couple or two or three or maybe four loaded cylinders that you could change, take this, you got it on your horse or on your belt, got a spare cylinder, put that on there, put this back together, and you're ready to go again. But you, uh, because you're close, when you're on a horse or close in fighting, you're like fighting from here across the street, uh, or if you're riding on a horse, you may, the horse, uh, horse to horse, or instead of man to man, uh, you're slashing and, and impaling with the saber. What the typical soldier would do with the, with the rifle that they had, they would dis if there was a long shot, they would probably dismount, and hold the shoulder, soldier, hold the horse, the soldier would hold the horse and, uh, fire with the weapon with the rifle. But you can load and fire one of these with one hand because it's a breech loader. Just take that off, lay that aside. Uh, some of these pistols up here were are con what, uh, pistols that Confederates are used. <coughs> this is a a uh, Colt Walker replica of a Colt Walker that uh, Confederate would use. Texas was a Confederate state, so uh, when they Texas Rangers uh, would have joined the war. They would have used the this type of weapon here, which is essentially a, it's such a big gun. It's a six-shot rifles. What it amounts to. It wasn't intended to be a sidearm. It was intended to be a a saddle gun, which it is. Okay, there was something else I was going to talk about. Okay, uniforms. Uh, we're kind of jumping around here in, in what we're talking about. This uniform, can you, what does it look like? Pajamas. Huh? Pajamas. <laughs> Looks like what? Pajamas. Well, yeah, but I mean, the colors, what, is it, what does it look like? That's Confederate, gray. Confederate, That's Confederate gray or something. Maybe. It's actually a replica of the first, uh, and second Iowa militia. Uh, so that was the first and second Iowa militia fought down in Wilson's Creek in Missouri in uh, July of 1861. So there was so much confusion uh, on that battle as well as first Manassas out in Virginia uh, because you had cadets that weren't cadet gray. Well, that was Confederate. Actually, it was before it was Confederate, but there was so much confusion that the both sides in the in the uh, war did last more than 90 days, more than six months. Uh, by the end of six months or so, 
they decided, well, we need both sides decided. We need to get our own colors, our own flags, our own uh, uniforms, our own muskets, our own guns and everything. So rather than try to use somebody else's. So that's when the northern troops, federal troops, wound up with this color and the Confederacy wound up with coffee. But this gun here, is there any questions that I can't answer? <laughs> or can't hear you? Yes? How many uniforms were the men issued, or how much were they issued? In how much? Mm -hmm. You mean in cost, or? Well, how many, like how many pants, how many? Oh, well, you know, it's just been issued one, one item, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Uh, at least early in the war, it had been issued just one item. As war, things wore out, and as the government procured, uh, the War Department procured money, they would have uniforms available for replacement. But a lot of soldiers would would buy uniform parts on their own from their pay. Uh, but mostly, they didn't really worry about uniform parts. Uh, they would buy some other stuff uh, to to help them survive or, or to endure the uh, circumstances a little easier with their pay and so forth. But, but yeah, really they were just issued one, one item on the uniform, but as they wore out, they would get reissued. And, and I, I guess I'm not real clear on how often they would get new, new things. I think it's as things wore out, there wasn't any time element. Uh, Yes. Uh, did they have accommodations for the right-handed and the left-handed people? Um, and also, how long did it take them to train a, a soldier from enlistment to, to uh, being ready to march out on the field? Well, a lot of recruits uh, in that day, uh, they were recruited one day and they were in battle the next day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ideally, after the, the, as the war progressed, uh, there was a, some training, uh, uh, I'm not, you know, like, there wasn't a lot of training, but like a, a lot of marching and commands of, uh, they didn't really know, need to know a lot, I guess, other than some marching commands and, and uh, ready, aim, shoot type commands and, and discipline was a big thing. Uh, but the, in a lot of cases that I've read about, anyway, that they were recruited one day and two days later they were in a battle, in a major battle. And that, that doesn't happen today, usually, anyway. Yes? What did they do, the Army, the military, the Army, the Union Army, when they went south? Because it's hot down there. What did they do about this? Hot. Hot? Yes. Well, yes. you were expected to wear a uniform, but ideally, you you seen soldiers. Uh, what they do? Well, soldiers with without without their top off or or on or something. Uh, but in as in those days, uh, even as a civilian, you wore hot clothing. Uh, you didn't wear light clothing or shorts or short sleeves. Uh, my, I remember my, one of my brother-in-laws, uh, his dad was a farmer, and he died a number of years ago, but uh, when I was growing up working on the farm for him, uh, I remember he, he wore long sleeve underwear year-round. It was 110 in the shade, he still had long sleeve underwear on, and a hat like I have on. Probably because it's and, and the only thing you've seen was his hands and his face and his neck. That's the only thing you ever seen. And you think, like, you think they wore uh, so, so like that? Myself, so, yeah, as, as I reenact, you get used to wearing something like that. You're expected to wear this. You need to drink a lot, hydrate yourself, keep yourself hydrated, but, uh, but you're expected to wear this because that's what they wore. Now, sometimes you'd get the order to remove your sack coat or something, yeah. You might fight a battle with, with a uh, long sleeve shirt on, but, but, but yeah, you were expected to wear it. Yes. Speaking of the heat, being a fabric person, wool is very um, coarse. It's very forgiving, and so when you have wool on, even in the hot summer, it wicks away. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So that, that's that's exactly right. You do sweat a lot, and by the sweat. 
you know, that evaporation does cool your body down. So you, but your body acclimates itself to that warmth and so forth. But, uh, but besides being hot, you get used to it. And, and she's right, you do sweat a lot, but the evaporation does cause your body to cool down. Yes? Speaking of the heat in the clothes, uh, the Civil War was fought in a lot of winter weather also. Yeah. Well, down and, south, and yeah. Did, ever, did they ever uh, give them extra coats or anything? Well, yeah, I, I didn't bring it with me, but they, we have what they call a great coat. It was a uh, a coat heavier than this. This is called a frock coat. This is the dressy part of the uniform. This is something that wouldn't necessarily have been issued, uh, but as you gained rank like a sergeant or above, uh, you would maybe buy one of these things, uh, and it's a frock coat, long-tailed uh, and it's a fancy dress, it's, it's, and it is warmer, but they have what they call a great coat that is bigger than this. If you've ever seen uh, a West Point cadet, they wear uh, a coat that's like a great coat. It has a cape on it and so forth, and that's what a great coat is. And yeah, those are available. But to, to mention, you know, you, you say the South was always hot, it wasn't. I took a trip. Several, I mean, one of several, but well, I, the, uh, I last. Uh, because I'm from Louisiana, as far south as you can get in fall and dump, and it's hot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I know what I was going to say. Down in Tennessee, parts oh, yeah. of Kentucky, and even northern northern parts of the yeah. Deep South, they do occasionally get snow, and it does cool off at night. Mm -hmm. I was down in Andersonville, Georgia, which yeah. is, that's in the Deep South, and uh, and. and it froze water. It got down to 20 degrees. That was up in the mountains. Uh, Andersonville is one of the prison camps and, and during the war. But yeah, it froze. So you needed uh, something well, warm. Sometimes it does, but you're fighting the war and it's... Yeah, well, it, but it got hot during the daytime, but it could, at night it got cold. And what I was going to say about this rifle, this is called a Berdan Sharps. The infantry, uh, one of the uh, special units, uh, a regiment out in the east used this, and it's a breech loading, uh, but it's a longer rifle. That's a carbine. This is about that much longer, but it loads the same. And what they would do is retrofit scopes on this, and they were doing sharpshooting. By the end of the war, they were, this unit was form to a sniper unit. So this was a, a rifle that was used for that. Easier to load and easier to carry. That's why there's a strap on it rather than a, a clip for the cavalry unit. Any more questions? Yeah, I know my wife's doing this, but well, well, we'll entertain more questions, yeah. Is that a hinge on that stock on the uh, I'm sorry? On the, on the stock, is that a hinge? What's that? Storage area. Well, I get a lot of questions about that. That carbine has the same thing. What it is, it's a ornamentation that's left over from the Revolutionary War days. Uh, when, they, when these were <coughs> retrofitted for uh, flintlocks, you used a, a round ball and you used, uh, they, they loaded differently. You, you put patches and balls in there. Well, that was before they used the, the cap. And if you put that stuff in there during the war, uh, you would just open that up and you'd lose it all. Anyway, it was on there, left on there for ornamentation, excuse me, from the Revolutionary War days. Because a lot of these weapons were, had been converted from flintlocks to cap. So, to answer your question, it wasn't used for anything other than looks. Uh, the, the newer uh, weapons that were issued, made after the initial part of these, this wasn't on there because they were worthless. They, nobody used them. Uh, the stuff that would have been used in there would be in these cap pouches and cartridge boxes. So I do, I, I do get a lot of questions about that, though. 
It's not used for anything other than looks, just left over. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any more? About how many reenactors are in Marshalltown, Marshall County? Or Marshall County, I'm not sure. There's probably 10 or 12. You know, we all don't cross paths all the time. Uh, Ron, Ron Crow is one. You know him. I'm sure he's a teacher, retired teacher. Uh, one of the cab groups I operate, Monty Amon, uh, Larry Depp, he used to be the postmaster. Uh, there was there's Jim Ramsey, the... I'm trying to think of some other names, uh, but there's probably 10 or 12 total that in this in the Marshall County area that that do these kinds of things. And there's quite a few all over the state, actually. If you look on the websites, uh, you you, know, you search go on the search engine and go uh, Civil War Iowa. There's a something going on every weekend through the summer, from April through October. Uh, there's a a, a, a reenactment that well it, it run about 12 years and uh, they say it's going to happen again this year but I will see anyway down in southern Iowa down in Bloomfield area uh, which is close to the Missouri border back in, in uh, 1863 October the 12th 1864 matter of fact there was a, uh, some Missouri partisans, which were Confederates, come up from Missouri and crossed over into Iowa, shot a Union captain that was home on leave and uh, killed a, a farmer and terrorized uh, a couple of counties down in there in that area for a couple of days. Then they rode back down in the St. Louis or the Kansas City area. And uh, anyway, uh, so that's where uh, we have a, a commemorative reenactment down there for that. Uh, uh, so, but that you know, that touched Iowa. Most people, or a lot of people, don't know that. A lot of historians that only come to light here. Oh, a lot of people knew about it, but it really wasn't very highly published. Uh, some people done research on it, but about 15 years ago, that's when that's come to light, and 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 there's a big monument down there to commemorate that, and uh, so. And then that's further north than Gettysburg, mm -hmm. geographically. But that's not a big battle, that's just a small mm -hmm. terrorist operation, if you will. And then and the person, people that were done this were, they were dressed as Union soldiers. Mm -hmm. So they were, according to the Articles of War, you could shoot them on, on you know, if you caught them, you, could, you didn't even have to have a trial, you just shoot them, mm -hmm. which they did, some of them, when oh. they did catch them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean that's that's the reality of that of those days, uh, because they were spies, and spies can be shot on the spot. Well, we thank you so much, Ken. Well, you're welcome. I mean, I, I, you can see him afterward. We have refreshments there and some posters about the Civil War. You're welcome to join us in the library. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer more questions. And oh, I do have some. If you want any of this replica money, you can have some here. <laughs> it's not worth anything other than, say, I got some. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you for, for coming and being such a penny body. So.